All right, while David is finishing getting set up, I'll go ahead and do some introductions. I'm uh, Todd Abbott, I'm the director of the Albany Chamber of Commerce. Uh, our, uh, we're, we're joined, I see, by the president of the chamber, uh, Sean Charles. I see Peggy McQuaid from, uh, I guess, vice mayor of City of Albany is here. Uh, Alan and Jennifer from Salon Avenue Association are here. And, and that's all I'm seeing on my screen right now, but the uh, other people are, we're excited to have you all here. Uh, our speaker today is David Moore, who is a, as you can see on the screen, PhD candidate in public health. And, and here he is, the uh, CEO of Intrinsic, well, let's see. What's, what's your, oh, Intrinsic, Environmental Health and Safety. So, uh, <laughs> so welcome. I, I don't wanna say too much. I think uh, everybody's here for some information. So I think we should get uh, right in. So welcome, David. Well, uh, thank you, Todd. I appreciate everyone's time today. I know uh, it's, there's a lot going on. And so similarly, want to launch into what we have today. Just briefly, um, my company has been providing services to a employer, a large employer out in, in the Sonoma County, specifically around COVID. And so the question I, I thought when we had a little bit of a lull, uh, like a week or two ago after they had been set up, about a month and a half's worth of work, we thought, hey, you know what, why don't we focus this back right here in our own backyard. My family and I have been living here since uh, 2007. We regularly patronize local businesses. We wanna see them continue to be successful. So as Todd mentioned, if you have questions, don't hesitate to send it to him in the chat and uh, that way we can, we can make this as interactive and as meaningful for you as possible. All right, here we go. So, um, as I was putting this together just yesterday, I believe, in fact, this came out that uh, new businesses are going to be potentially authorized to reopen as early as Friday. So as you all know, things are changing constantly. So it's really important for all of us to be well informed and to ultimately become experts on this, right? And, and my caveat for today is what is in the presentation today is, is the best knowledge that we have as of right now, as you know, things are constantly changing in terms of what we understand about the disease, in terms of the regulations, in terms of the public health orders, best practices, all of that uh, is, is constantly changing. There are some things which we'll discuss that have stayed relatively constant throughout this whole, this whole process. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this just came out, I think two days ago. So, you know, I would expect things to continue, continue to uh, be updated. So a new, this is not obviously an all-inclusive list of, of businesses. This would be another group in addition to the recently uh, approved list of businesses that we're going to specifically talk about, that I was initially planning to talk about. So, so David, I would just yeah. cut in here for a second, just, just to point out that um, the county of Alameda is, is going a little more slowly than the state. So this, this county's not opening it up quite that much yet, uh, just FYI. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good uh, information. Um, and we'll we'll kind of go over the differences between both the fact that we've got a state uh, stay at home order as well as a local uh, shelter in place here in the county. So, uh, great point, Todd. So, some of the over overarching questions we want to address are: How do we get back to business? Right. That's something that we ultimately uh, will have to do. Uh, what can we learn from other frontline essential businesses like restaurants and others that have already been doing this? So like I said, I'd like to keep this interactive. So if there's something where you see an example of something where you said, okay, this worked really well for us, or this is why it didn't work well for us, this is a group learning opportunity, right? I come with a, a, a specific uh, skill set, um, but you all have been doing it. You all have been living it. And part of what I hope to do is also share with you as I've been going on my walks normally, up uh, Solano Avenue and around town, just noting, oh, that's great. That's, that's an ideal practice as I've been uh, patronizing local businesses. Um, what are those businesses that have been given the green light here in Alameda? We'll take a look at the local public health order to get more insight into that. And ultimately, how do we reopen? This is a challenge that I'm wrestling with with one of my, our, our big clients right now. So ultimately, in order to answer those questions, we're going to look at uh, briefly, the governor's stay-at-home order. We're going to look at just kind of get an overview of COVID-19. There's a lot of information out there. And as I've been telling my parents, really critical to be um, choosy about your sources of information, right? So everything that I've put in here, I, I believe, and if I haven't, I'll fix that, there should be a link. There should be a source to something official, whether it's the CDC, EPA, 
Alameda County, et cetera. Um, we're gonna look at some, some best practices that you'll find have uh, matched up nicely with, with the requirements that are in the local public health order. And just to clarify, I don't work for Alameda County. Uh, I'm a consultant uh, that helps to interpret and operationalize these requirements and rules, whether it's Cal OSHA or EPA, or in this case, uh, local public health uh, county. Um, so we've done a tremendous job as a, as a state in, in flattening the curve, right? And, and Governor Newsom has, set, has stressed time and again that what we determine, when we determine the right time to open up is gonna be driven by science and data. And so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. So flattening the curve, right? This was maybe a week ago when I pulled this off. We've absolutely crushed the curve, right? That doesn't mean that we're out of, we're out of the, the woods yet, as you all know, right? We're, we're concerned about the potential for another resurgence as people start to relax and think, oh, I don't need to observe all of these same protocols that I did previously and we could see ultimately the same. I kind of like to think of this, actually I like the fact that this is red and it looks like fire because I think about this being like a fire right, being like a wildfire. And that I've heard, you know, younger people talk to me and say, yeah, I don't care if I get it or not. It's like, yeah, but the thing is, is if you get it, you can't control who you give it to. It's like wildfire and this forest has never burned, right? Nobody has immunity to this. And even if you've gotten it, of course, we don't know for sure that that confers uh, immunity. But it, collectively, we're, we've done an incredible job of, of giving the, the healthcare uh, establishment a chance to get caught up and to be prepared for another potential surge in the future. So uh, as I mentioned, the governor's stay-at-home order is really focusing on these six key indicators and the one that we're going to kind of focus on is really the uh, or the one that's most salient for us is the one in the bottom middle, uh, the ability for businesses and schools uh, and child care facilities to support physical distancing. And that's really what that's about, right? So that, that shaded portion on the right of your screen there, that's really the kind of potential for where it could go, the sort of estimates, the upper and lower bounds of, of what we project out. So as Todd mentioned, we've got a local Alameda County uh, shelter in place in effect, and that's currently scheduled until the 31st of May in Sonoma County, it's indefinite. Do they want the ability to adjust it? up or down, I think we should also be ready for that as well, right? As, as things, as new information comes to light, things are constantly changing. It could for us because we're, we're closer to a much more densely packed urban area, lasts a little bit longer than we would initially expect. Um, but essentially, you know, allows for, as, as many of you all know, uh, certain low risk activities, right? Anything that's essential to our health and safety, uh, if we need to obtain uh, necessary services, we've got a detailed list specifically in the order. If we're performing essential services or work, right? And then obviously we've got to get some, some recreation time. We need to get outside as long as we're able to maintain that six feet of distance. We're going to cover why that's so critical. I think this is the absolute most important part. If you are sick, you need to self-isolate, right? There, there are other things out there, right? There's common cold, there's influenza, there's allergies. Um, we don't know, right? We just don't have the testing infrastructure to be able to uh, accurately determine who, who has it and then who have they been exposed to and let's test that, right? That's, you've probably heard this buzzword, contact tracing uh, in, in the community where you figure out this is what they did in South Korea after they got devastated by uh, MERS years ago. They said, okay, we're, we need to be prepared for this the next time it comes. They're, all, they're opened up, right? People are out on the streets, businesses are back online they had a very different system set up, right? We, we had that, I believe, during the Obama administration that got dismantled. Don't wanna get into the politics of that, but, um, but we were not, I think, as a, as a nation as prepared as we could have been. But again, going back to this, most important part, piece of this, I think, is if you're sick, you should self-isolate. Um, all right, so there's also uh, other, so a number of additional businesses that have, lower risk because they're outdoors, right? The virus, uh, we're gonna cover the, the roots of transmission in a second, but essentially within six feet indoors is where we've seen the vast majority of that transmission, right? If you're outdoors, the likelihood, the possibility, sure, is there, 
the likelihood goes down dramatically. Um, there are specific provisions in there for childcare and camps that are able to, that are providing care for uh, people who are, like my cousin, she works as, uh, at uh, UC Davis Medical, so her child is in childcare right now. Um, other outdoor activity, other outdoor businesses, right? There are certain requirements for, for all of these uh, facilities, but this was newly implemented or newly uh, opened just this past uh, week. And they all require a social distancing protocol, which I have not seen in many of the businesses that I've been to uh, posted. And we're gonna talk about that as well. So industrial hygienists, that's what I do. We are considered essential workers. We anticipate, recognize, evaluate, and control hazards. We're, um, so I'm a member as well of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. For example, I was just recently up there fit testing with N95 respirators in Sonoma County. So there, that's a part of the work that I do as well. Here's our enemy, right? It's not living, it's a virus. It, it, it's got a protein code on the outside. It's got RNA on the inside, right? Genetic instructions. It finds a receptor in your res respiratory tract it gets into the cell, it hijacks the cell, it tells the cell, replicate, make more of, of me and spread me out to the rest of the world, right? Uh, I've heard it said before that the best virus is one that doesn't kill you, right? And this one is really good at spreading because for the vast majority of people, they're either asymptomatic or their symptoms are mild. So this one is going to stretch, right? It's got, it's got long legs. Something like Ebola, which you are really sick, really fast, you're not going anywhere. It's, it's a lot harder to transmit that to a large population. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? The fact that it's, it's so mild for so many means it can travel so far and potentially be detrimental for, for those of us that, are, that are, are more vulnerable. How does it spread, right? So as I said, a lot has changed since we've begun learning about this virus back in December. This has stayed pretty constant. The CDC still contends that it's between people who are in close contact with, the, uh, with one another within six feet through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes. And we're gonna talk about why that's the case, right? These droplets is believed land in the mouth, the respiratory tract get inhaled into the lungs. Um, this they believe is the primary driver, the primary way in which this is spreading. Incubation period is about uh, two to 14 days, right? So if I were exposed, I got it in me, and the virus is, rep is, is multiplying, anywhere between two to 14 days is when I might start to become infectious. I might not be symptomatic, right? I become infectious at that point. Uh, so someone who were to complete that 14-day quarantine should be no risk to anyone else, assuming they've not been re-exposed some other way. Um, we don't know how long we're infectious for. What they have found in one version of the test is that the RNA fragments, right, the genetic material in the virus, can remain in the nasal passages for up to six weeks. We would think it's not infectious. We don't know, right? That's one thing that's, uh, that's unknown yet. So you might have, your symptoms might have cleared up. You may still be sneezing because you have allergies like me, and you could potentially be spreading it to, to others, even though your, your course of that of COVID-19 is potentially cleared. And that's a big reason why we've got the continued social distancing in place, the continued use of face coverings in place, et cetera. This is also really important. People are thought to be most contagious when they are symptomatic, when they are the sickest. And, but you know, granted the virus has also been detected in asymptomatic persons, but when people are sick, and this is why I said this is so important, when you're sick, you stay home, right? You isolate even if you're not sure, even if your test is negative, right? That's, that's my particular uh, approach there. Uh, there are other things we don't know, as I mentioned. There are a number of aerosol. Uh, so an aerosol is basically, you know, you spray out of a can when we sneeze, when we cough, when we talk even, right? We're emitting small particles of saliva and, and mucus if you're coughing and sneezing. We don't know how far it can travel. We think, based on the epidemiological data, that it's, it's probably most infectious in that six feet range. Again, this is where the vast majority of transmission has occurred. Is it possible that it can go further? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have some data that indicates how long it lives on surfaces. We don't know about all surfaces. 
Um, we believe that some asymptomatic individuals can be spreading it. And we don't know yet if you are able to be reinfected even after you've had it once and developed antibodies. Yuck, what is that? And don't hesitate to stop and ask any questions as we go along. Yes, that is somebody sneezing, right? That is absolutely disgusting. There are hundreds of thousands of particles that are in the air. It doesn't take much, right? Each, each tiny droplet, okay, I'll, I'll move that from that, it's kind of disgusting. Um, each tiny droplet can contain, you know, millions of, of viral particles, potentially. There's this concept called infectious dose. That's also something we don't know yet either, right? If you were to get um, one bacterium of tuberculosis, that's enough to get an infection. But there are other things that require a much higher dose of a particular pathogen. It might have an infectious dose that might be what relates to that six feet rule. Again, it's an area we don't know. Um, and wrong. That's good. Better. And this is really why we're wearing the face coverings, right? It's, it's source control for, for our face. It's a, it's a, a barrier to, present, to pre, uh, prevent it from spreading to others. Just a little bit about uh, aerosol. So you've all heard of PM10, right, during the fires. We've got PM10, PM2.5. The smaller it is, the longer it can stay airborne. So the stuff that you see drops out of suspension fairly rapidly, right? The big stuff, the stuff that healthcare providers are exposed to within a few feet because they're performing some aerosol generating procedure like intubation, they're, they're at a, a extremely high risk because they've got a lot of large particles potentially coming out at them. They're wearing face shields, they're wearing N95 respirators, they're wearing gowns and gloves. Uh, for the vast majority of us, if we're wearing source covering, uh, source control, right, facial covering, that's not going to be a, a likely route of exposure. We're looking at more of the smaller uh, particles that can linger in an unwell ventilated uh, space. Um, the vast majority of particles that we emit when we're talking are in that two to a thousand micron range, right? So that's why there's some speculation that while the vast majority of transmission is happening in that six foot, well, there's possibility that it's small enough to stay airborne and remain around longer. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, Ebola. Measles has a much uh, further range. This is, of course, roughly the spot that uh, we think translates to, uh, to coronavirus. Uh, let's see if I can pull this aerosol. How do I switch to new share? So I go to new share and then I click here. Nope, not that one. Where did it go? Sorry, bear with me for a second here. This is, this will be worth it when I get it up. All right, can you all see that? You can give me a thumbs up, Todd, if you can see that. Cool, all right, so here's a 3D assimilation uh, from the New York Times of what an aerosol can do without face covering, right? So eventually what happens is those, those droplets start to evaporate and the smaller they are, the longer that they can stay airborne. You see the six foot ring there. And over time, especially in an indoor setting, those smaller, smaller particulate aerosol can make its way a little bit further, right? Eventually what we suspect spreading up to uh, 26 feet. Even when someone's talking, they can emit some aerosol, like I'm talking loudly right now. Um, but when you've got a face covering on, that is extremely diffuse. It doesn't stop everything, right? But it's it reduces it dramatically. All right. So, you back to the regular PowerPoint, Todd? Thumbs up, good? Not yet. Not yet. And while you're working on that, I would just mention everybody, I, I posted this a couple times that if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if if uh, that's not easy for you, you can send me an email or a text. Uh, the number and the email address are in the chat. Thanks, Todd. You back in the right place? Yes, you are. It looks great. Okay, cool. All right. So um, as I mentioned, the vast majority of transmission we believe is airborne, but there's also a potential for this to spread on surfaces. So a study at UCLA 
looked at how long it lives on uh, steel and plastic, and it can last for uh, several several hours, right? Uh, in in airborne, and it can last for several days on on plastic and stainless steel. The other question too is how long does that aerosol remain remain viable? Sunlight is actually really uh, damaging for for viral RNA. It it just destroys it. Um, don't know how fast it would degrade that. There are some hospital settings that use UV light to disinfect air. Same principle. Um, it's it's not, you know, destroy. It's not destroying it. I should say it's it's deactivating that uh, that RNA. Its ability to replicate. So it's not viable. What are the signs and symptoms? So this is what we began, right? Um, a few months ago, this was the list that we were given, but that's ex since expanded. Right, as we've learned more, there are a number of other symptoms that we ought to be on the lookout for, both from ourselves, our coworkers, uh, potentially people that we're, we're interacting with, people that we're doing business with. One, one uh, protocol that we're putting in place is if someone is going to be interacting with one of their clients, that they would do some kind of a pre-screen. Have you had any of these symptoms lately, right? If you're gonna be meeting with them. Um, here are some more serious uh, symptoms, right? That again are in the in the minority of of people that are exposed, but things also just to be aware of that are uh, potential COVID related symptoms. Again, the, the the notion of being really sick is probably related to this, right? The viral load, the amount of viral, all those little yet yellow dots there, that's all virus. And so the, the, the amount of virus in a, in a person's body, when they start to get sick, when they feel, oh, I feel terrible, this is, this is uh, when they have the most potential pathogens, why it's so important for them to isolate. Uh, when I came back from one of my most recent uh, visits, I thought, ah, I, I've had a little symptoms, I'm a little, feel a little off. I went and got a test and I isolated until I got a test that came back and said negative. Um, wasn't sure, right? Didn't know. We've got uh, drugs uh, that are in, in manufacture, right? We don't know yet how, how, um, how effective they're going to be. There's some promising evidence out there. I don't work for Gilead. I should probably indicate that I do own some Gilead stock. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is probably going to be where we're going to we're going to find uh, the most bang for our buck is in vaccines there are 70 being developed not all of them will make it uh, to market and uh, bill gates actually had a great presentation on on vaccines and whatnot uh, but they all they have to start basically manufacturing they have to start the manufacturing plant long before they even know if the vaccine is going to be efficacious but uh, there's 70 in the works but we can't rely exclusively on vaccines and treatments, right? They're just not going to be here in the short term. We have to use what I, uh, the framework that us industrial hygienists leverage is called the hierarchy of controls. And you're gonna find that you've already been doing a lot of these things in your businesses. You already are thinking this way. Um, elimination, right? The first thing we've been doing, we've been told to shelter in place to eliminate the potential for me to spread it to, to others, for the potential for someone else to spread it to me. Um, we're gonna talk about each of these as we, as we go down, right? So, so social distancing, there are a couple people who disagree with me on, on this idea of, of elimination, people in, in my field, that's fine. Uh, but I think of it as not eliminating entirely, and that was the disagreement, which that's true. It doesn't eliminate it, right? Because you're six feet, it's not some magical barrier that's gonna prevent any, any uh, aerosol from making it over to my lungs or my, my respiratory uh, tract, but it does reduce it, right? It's eliminating some of it. That's how I think of it as. I like actually the World Health Organization's shift on this, which is they're calling it physical distancing rather than social distancing, because we really do need our, our, uh, our social uh, connections, right? Uh, especially if we've got family members who are living alone. I'm sure we've been, we've been thinking about them a lot, trying to reach out to them and, and, uh, and stay connected with all of them. Uh, engineering controls. So a lot of restaurants are already doing this. 
right? You can't, maybe you can't see it. There's a, a plexiglass barrier that the outline goes around. It's a sneeze guard, right? It's not, if someone were, were sick or they were infectious and they were to sneeze on that, all that large droplet would get trapped there. Doesn't mean that the small stuff couldn't make its way around. So all of these methods are not a silver bullet in and of themselves, right? It, it all relies on each of those hierarchy of controls working together, eliminating the people from being sick in the workplace, right? But I might not realize I'm sick until middle of the day when I'm out getting some food somewhere. We have administrative controls, right? We, we're washing our hands for 20 seconds, right? That There's a video, I won't show the video, but um, you can look at it later if you want, that shows basically how soap and water is so effective at, at absolutely just pulling apart the, the, uh, the, the virus, making it inactive. Um, a lot of people are concerned about, about surface contamination, right? You can't, as you know, you cannot get it through your hands. It's when I touch the surface and then I touch my nose or I touch my eyes or I rub my face. And then if I'm infectious, if I touch my face and then touch another surface and then someone else touches that surface and then touches their face, right? Then we have the potential for transmission. It's a possible route of exposure. It's again, not believed to be the primary driver. A lot of people are obsessed with, um, you know, just squirting hand sanitizer into their hands all day long to the point where they run out of hand sanitizer when they actually need it. And we're gonna talk about that as well. But soap and water more effective than hand sanitizer. But, but really, again, it, doesn't, it does not pass through your skin. It is something that if you are able to resist the urge to touch your face when you're out and about, obviously if you're in your own home, and you have no reason to assume to be, uh, to be contaminated, no problem. Uh, here's the video, you guys can watch it later. Uh, personal protective equipment, right? We see a lot of people out there, we've been advised by the public health order to wear a face covering. There, there are people out there wearing surgical masks, N95 respirators. I really like to think of these as being, you know, saved for uh, our healthcare workers, right? If, if, if we all had enough to go around, sure, that it would make sense. Um, but if there is in fact a, a dire shortage of, of respirators, I like the idea of those being in the hands of the people that, that ultimately need them the most that are fighting to keep our, our, our loved ones uh, safe. Um, there are some other more, uh, more filtering respirators out there that some in some professions may, may find valuable. Here's a picture of our Surgeon General demonstrating simply a facial covering, right? Again, the, the facial covering does not protect the wearer. It's not, a, it's not a tight fitting respirator. It does not filter air. It is really about protecting people around me and vice versa, the people that are wearing them is protecting me. So I don't think of it as public health, uh, as a personal protective equipment. Good gracious, this is a lot of text and this is just the opening paragraph. I would encourage you, I, I'm not gonna suggest you read it now. I would suggest though that you do read it if you have not, um, but we're gonna go through some of the high points. So um, actually maybe, maybe I'll just pause really quickly right there before we launch into this, if there, if there are any questions, uh, Todd, that have come in. We can also save them for the end too, if, you're, if you wanna hold. Uh, well, I would say we have received one question that's appropriate or, or that yeah. uh, is timely. Uh, yeah. I, and I think you've said a little bit about this, but yeah. uh, do, do we know if a virus becomes less potent on surfaces over time? Yeah, that's a great question. I would think that that over time, right? So CDC recently released guidance saying that if you have not been in your you know, retail store or in your office building for a week, if there was any virus there, don't worry about it. It's not viable. There's, there's no viable virus left. Just net standard uh, routine cleaning is sufficient. You don't need to do any additional disinfection. Um, there was a study in that same study actually that looked at surface area. They were looking at the viral titer. So that means how, uh, how active that virus still was. And so what they found is about at about 2.7 hours when that virus was remain, remain airborne, that about half of that virus was still viable, was still active. Um, it had the potential to be infectious. I think that, I don't know what the, what the curve is, so I'd have to look back at that study to, to know for sure. But I'm, 
uh, pretty confident in that three day uh, window. And, but CDC has added a cushion to that, just saying, you know, a week is, is what, they're, what they're looking at. But I would assume, yes, that over time, it's becoming, you know, it's breaking down, it's becoming less viable. Again, that's gonna depend on the surface. There are certain antibacterial or antimicrobial properties to copper, for example. Um, not suggesting everybody replace everything with copper. Um, maybe you want to buy some copper stock. I'm just kidding. I was going to say, um, do you own copper stock? Because no, <laughs> do not. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I would assume that that depending on the surface, and that's the thing is just there's so many variables there. But that certainly over time you would expect the the virus to to degrade. I don't know if that uh, helped answer that. No, I'm sure it did. And and. Uh, uh, are you planning to say more about how you disinfect surfaces? Yes, we're going we're gonna to get into that. You yep. probably would. And then this is, this is a comment that was posted to everyone, and I would just mention just maybe you can think about it, maybe the others can think about it. Uh, for most retail businesses, curbside pickup isn't really going to work. It's kind of useless for a shoe store or a clothing store. So what other alternatives might there be? Uh, just kind of keep that in mind. You don't need to yeah. talk about that right now, but yeah, no, that's uh, a great question. I everybody, think, think everybody, that. everybody should be should be thinking about. We can we can uh, add that to the list of discussion items at the at the end. Yeah, great. So, okay, that's that's it for now. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Um, so other so this is just a list of examples of other essential businesses that were recently given the green light. Um, there are more to this, so that's why I encourage you to look at the order if you if you uh, have any doubts. Um, it's a more, more expensive list than, than I would have thought. This is, uh, sorry, a very busy slide, but the really, the, the, the key piece here is that this is the social distancing protocol, uh, which is Appendix A of the public health order, which I talked to one of my lawyer friends who works for a county who was part of the team that put this together. I said, so is this enforceable? And he said, yeah, it, it is, but I think, my personal opinion is that they would be loath to enforce it, especially as businesses are just trying trying to stay in business, but potentially they could, right? Um, so we'll, we'll cover what's contained kind of at a high level uh, in, this, in the social distancing protocol and sort of give examples of what you already are doing. Um, so it requires signage, uh, measures to protect your employees, measures to protect crowds from gathering, uh, physical distancing, unnecessary contact, and measures to increase sanitation, which we're gonna cover. So they've got a, a number of items in here that the protocol basically says, all right, what are you doing to address all of these things here? So here, I'll show you, this is what you're doing, right? Limiting exposure, saying, okay, only one person at a time can enter into this facility. These are all photos from my recent walks up and down uh, Solano. Um, Mask required, requiring face coverings to be worn, right? Again, this is to protect the other people in that environment, right? Not necessarily protection for the wearer. Establishing where individuals should stand, right? To maintain physical distancing. Providing contactless payment systems. Actually, I'm gonna experiment with this this afternoon. My daughter and I are gonna go for a walk. Um, another option, right, is if that's not feasible, to be able to disinfect communal, you know, uh, high touch surfaces after, after each use. That might be tricky, right? I know disinfectants are in short supply, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some, some potential alternatives there. Having signage, right? Just to let people know if you're sick, don't come here, right? <laughs> don't, bring your, don't bring your germs into this place. Um, I think this is a good idea, right? Making appointments to limit the number of people who could potentially enter a space at one time, um, providing virtual services, as I'm sure a number of you have had to uh, figure out ways to do. Um, curbside pickup, which as Todd mentioned, maybe is not a viable option for, for many. Maybe it's an option for some, but uh, you know, we, can, we can explore uh, that as well. Uh, I also like this, right? Creating a one-way flow so you don't have people crisscrossing as they're moving. Uh, this is another resource that for those that have office spaces, more traditional style office spaces can look at this document that's in the link of resources in the PowerPoint, kind of redesigning how office spaces might be laid out, right? This, we know that, uh, you know, we, as I mentioned in the very beginning, we, we're, we absolutely crushed the curve, but we're not out, right? We, we think maybe we've got 1% of the population 
uh, exposed at this point, COVID is going to be around for a while, right? Likely until we've got the vaccine. Um, so we're going to have to really be thinking over the next couple of years, how do we make these adjustments? Uh, yikes. Summary of CDC opening, reopening guidance. So we're going to talk about uh, each of these. Essentially, it's you know, normal cleaning, using EPA approved disinfectants if you have them available. We're going to cover some alternatives uh, to make sure that we're using things according to the label. That's, that's really uh, because it is essentially being utilized as an insecticide. The law is, or the label is the law of that particular product. Um, make sure people aren't mixing chemicals, right? Two, two does not always make it better especially if you've got ammonia and bleach, you've got incompatible chemicals, you're releasing possibly harmful chemicals into the, uh, into the breathing zone, whoever's working with that. And also encouraging people not to stockpile. Uh, I know this is gonna be a challenging one for a lot of people. And then of course, wearing appropriate personal protective equipment for the, that particular product, that particular chemical. So they recommend developing a plan, right? If you haven't yet reopened, think about what needs to be cleaned, right? And as I mentioned before, if you haven't been there for seven days, don't worry about it, right? But think about a plan going forward. What do I need to be disinfecting on a regular basis, right? All those high, to high touch surfaces, and you can probably add some things to that list. Uh, some other suggestions, right? Consider creating a screening protocol. So a number of congregate living facilities, right, have done this because chances are it's somebody who works there potentially bringing it into that space, whether it's, um, you know, correctional facility or, um, you know, a nursing home or some other facility like that, having some kind of a screening uh, procedure and checking in right throughout the course of the day. A lot of healthcare providers are already, are already implementing this, maybe even getting a touchless uh, infrared thermometer to just check temperature, whoa, you look a little red, let's double check that, over 100, ah, you know what, maybe you should, uh, you should head home. Something else that I did not include on this is that there was a study that looked at the availability of sick time and the likelihood of people to stay home when they were sick, when they did not have sick time. And as you can imagine, if you don't have sick pay, paid sick, sick leave, you're gonna have more of a, a feeling like I need to be at work, right? I need, I need to keep my job. I need to make sure my, my family gets taken care of. That could potentially be a higher, I would think it's a higher risk factor, right? Um, so be aware of that in your own, own organization. I worked in the restaurant industry for about a dozen years. I think it was only towards the end of my career that I ended up um, getting, uh, getting sick, sick pay and, and vacation. So I know it's it's difficult for a lot of uh, a lot of businesses, but something to be to be mindful of. Um, monitor your usage of of your supplies, and there are alternatives, right? You can use a third of a cup of bleach and a gallon of water. Um, consider removing soft and porous uh, materials, right? They're, that are just difficult to clean. Why would you want to uh, worry about that? Oh, and certainly do not waste your uh, your mezcal. It's not strong enough, right? You need at least 70% uh, alcohol to be able to disinfect the virus. Save that for, for uh, drinking with friends and we can all get together again. Okay, um, so I know that sometimes there's questions about how long does bleach last? You know, how long is it going to deactivate uh, the virus? Well, if it's left out into the open, it is also light sensitive. It's going to off gas chlorine if it is not contained, stored in a, uh, an opaque container. Right, so like the the bottle of uh, that's pictured there, it's not it's you know light can't get through it, so it can last a much much longer period of time. So if you have containers like that, there's a potential for that bleach to stretch out a lot farther. Granted, bleach is not great for all kinds of services. Um, I don't know. So up in Sonoma County, there are a number of distilleries that are making hand sanitizer, that are making alcohol solution and distributing it. There are a number of local operations. Right, UC Berkeley has one going on. Um, so consider exploring those. I haven't personally looked into, into what's available out there, but there could be alternatives if you're having difficulty obtaining those, um, those disinfectants, because I would expect shortages and, and bottlenecks in the supply chain are going to continue. Um, so having, knowing, you know, having that plan, knowing what your throughput is, knowing what your usage is, where are your high-touch surfaces, really focusing. I mean, you know, we don't need to be 
cleaning walls, um, you know, that's generally not considered a high test surface to handle. Uh, something you're using to pay on, absolutely. Something else to be aware of, this has not yet um, happened, but I think this is in discussion currently is whether or not it's considered uh, work related, right? If someone were to come down with, with COVID, whether they would be entitled to workers' comp uh, benefits. Again, this is something that uh, could change in the future, is not currently the case. In, in sum, as we, uh, as we wind down here, it's really about, you know, if you're sick, stay home. Right? Avoiding close contact just because we don't know exactly when we become infectious. We might be asymptomatic ourselves, right? We're healthy, we're sharing it around with other people. So we will, that's why we want to continue to avoid that close contact. The, the one thing the virus needs is to transmit from person to person, right? We interrupt that transmission cycle, it cannot replicate. It cannot continue to move through the population. Um, covering our Covering our cough, right? Whether that's with a face covering, if that's what's required, avoiding touching our face, especially when we're out in public, cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched objects and surfaces, and then making sure that, you know, just as a habit, right? As an industrial hygienist and public health guy, I come home, I would always wash my hands after taking, taking the bus. It's just, just routine practice. I'm sure it is for all of you now as well, uh, if it wasn't already before. But it's really, it, it really boils down to those uh, simple fundamental. Uh, things. A lot of additional resources, a lot of information out there. I tried to compile a list of what I felt was most salient for, uh, for this group, right? Um, you've got, of course, your uh, CDC guidance, the Alameda County Public Health, a list of EPA registered disinfectants that are effective against the virus that causes COVID-19. There's Additional resources now on the American Industrial Hygiene Association website. They're putting out updating guidance for the new sectors that have kind of been given the green light to get back to work. And so they've got a couple pages. They tend to be more protective um, than, than regulations and even the CDC would be. Um, might not always be feasible, right? They may ask or suggest to recommend an N95 respirator when they aren't available. But again, it's sort of that dance of, are they available? Should we be prioritizing them for healthcare providers? Maybe in your situation, if you're within close proximity to somebody because you, know, you have to uh, conduct body work or, or you know, acupuncture or you're fitting someone with shoes, maybe there is, there is a legitimate reason why you would want that additional layer of, of protection. Um, obviously, your Albany Chamber of Commerce uh, as a resource and then the face covering FAQs I thought was helpful. Another list of resources here. This is more on the academic side. So Nature, they pick, they compile all the best articles. They're, you know, they publish uh, a lot of scientific uh, uh, work. Johns Hopkins University, top public health school in the, in the country. They put out um, a, one of them. They've, they've got a great, great map to visualize or to just terrify yourself about how it's moving throughout the, the country and the globe. The University of Washington is the one that came up with that uh, model that, that we saw early on, the curve, essentially. Uh, California Department of Public Health also has a coronavirus response plan. UCLA, uh, Labor Occupational Safety and Health, has got uh, information as well as the International Facility Management Association uh, they've got a document out there for recovery readiness. And I know that was a lot to, uh, to cover. One other thought uh, that we had that, that I proposed to Todd, something that is also a question for all of you, is if this is something that would be of interest, that would be of value to have a third party come in, take a look at your work practices, make recommendations about how, given what's available, Right. If you can't order bleach, then what do we do? Right. What do we? What can we do as, a, as an alternative to that? Um, to provide some kind of assurance to your to your staff, to your customers, that you have taken the social distancing protocol seriously. You're doing everything you can to protect yourselves, to protect your your employees, to protect the public. I don't know if that's something that will um, provide an additional 
bump for me it would obviously but that's because this is what i do but if, if it's something you want to think about and 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 maybe todd and, and the, the rest of the chamber have some ideas about this that you're free to discuss with me without me either way uh that we could partner up to possibly help provide some some additional uh assurances to to the public because as i mentioned this is about protecting everyone's health and well-being but also getting back to work the right way making sure that we keep that curve as low as, as reasonably achievable. And with that, I'll just open it up for uh, general questions. Okay, folks, um, I, I haven't really received any other texted comments. I have a couple myself, a, a couple coming in. So now is a good time to post your comments and feel free to ask about your specific business. Like if you, if you do have some particular thing about your business you wanna ask about, now would be an appropriate time. So Absolutely. I just have a question yeah. and, uh, I haven't heard a lot about uh, if you know you're in a closed space. Uh, what about opening the windows? Does that help? Uh, you know, get, get air out of there. What if you have people lined up near the window rather than in the middle of the space? Does that sort of thing help? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, again, so it's going to depend on the, each unique situation. So some modern buildings that have uh, forced air ventilation, right? They're bringing air in through an air handler and they're distributing it out through the building. There is some recommendations out there from uh, ASHRAE, which is they set the standards for those HVAC systems. They suggest to increase the amount of ventilation that's moving through a space. They re recommend increasing the amount of uh, fresh air that's coming in to basically push out whatever I'm bringing in, whatever my coworkers are bringing in, whatever the, the public is bringing in. If you don't have a forced air ventilation system, then yeah, absolutely opening, opening a window could help, right? It's not going to be the, the thing, right? All of this is, we think of a Swiss cheese model, right? If, if I'm wearing a face covering, if I'm maintaining six feet of distance, if I'm washing my hands regularly, if I'm not touching my face, all these things working together line up such that, you know, one of them hopefully will stop the, the virus from, again, that one thing that it needs, which is to transmit to a new host. Um, if you had people right outside who were coughing and sneezing and talking and the windows were open there and the wind was coming in from outside, maybe that's a different story. So it's gonna be, you know, think about the way the air moves in your particular space. Weather's really nice out if you're, if you're able to keep things uh, open and, and airy. We do know that in spaces that have very, very sluggish ventilation, you know, like less than an air change per hour. An air change is basically how much air in that space is turning over. So the whole volume of whatever room you're in is turning over, if that's turning over in one hour, that's one air change. That's really minimal ventilation. It's probably like the inside of someone's house. Um, then we do know that the virus, the aerosol can linger for a little bit longer, right? So that air being able to move through is, is absolutely helpful for sure. What about air purifiers? Would they play a part or? Yeah, so again, you know, not a, not a magic bullet. Um, it won't stop me from getting sick if, if all the other layers in that, um, you know, in, in the Swiss cheese model, in the hierarchy of controls are not, uh, are not followed. But certainly depending on the type of filter, uh, even, you know, a MERV 13 filter, which is just a, you know, something you can purchase for your own home at, at Ace Hardware, they, they should be small enough to filter out a lot of the viral particles, not all of them. Again, it's about reducing it. If you have a, a more sophisticated filter, a HEPA filter, that's gonna filter out 99.97% of the smallest and most, not the smallest, but one of the most difficult sizes to, uh, to trap due to the physics of it. But they'll, they'll take everything out, but again, it's not going to reach out, grab the entire uh, volume of air and, and suck it through that filter, right? It's not a, like if you imagine a, a snorkel exhaust, something that's right up to the source of emission, it doesn't work that way. So it'll overall reduce the load, it'll reduce the burden in, in an indoor space, but how much it's going to be, how effective it's going to be, if that's gonna give you enough bang for your buck, it is to be determined, right? Again, keeping the, the source control and minimizing the, the volume, the number of people who are in an indoor space, I think is going to have a more uh, 
uh, more demonstrable effect in the long in the long term. So, uh, just kind of continuing that, are, do you, are there recommendations for specific ventilation or HVAC systems? Uh, I mean, maybe it's just kind of repeating what you've just said, but no, not at all. It's, it's, that's a good question. Um, in the healthcare profession, right? If you are performing aerosol generating procedures, if you are working with people who are COVID positive, they are coughing, they are sneezing, they are symptomatic. Ventilation plays an essential role for minimizing the exposures to the healthcare workers. As I mentioned, in, a, in an ordinary house, you're probably looking at about an, an air change per hour, if that. In those hospital settings, you're looking at 12 air changes per hour. So like every five minutes, the volume of the air in that space is turning over. Um, so ventilation in those settings where you've got someone coughing, sneezing, they're confirmed COVID-19 positive, um, you wanna protect the healthcare workers, ventilation is essential. Um, what about like a gym, kind of the same thing apply for a gym? Yeah, so there, I mean, again, if you have some form of way to pre-screen and make sure that if people are sick, they're not coming in, then your chances of spreading, right? Again, as I said, there's a possibility for someone who's asymptomatic to transfer it to someone else. But if, if they're not infectious, if they're not symptomatic, then it's likely that they're, they're not going to be aerosolizing as much, right? Enough uh, to be able to get other people sick. But, you know, I was thinking about this, right? The gym locations up, up and down uh, Solano, like where would you relocate the, the different machines and, and having them adequately spaced? Maybe it's reorienting them, like one facing one direction, one facing the other. Uh, I don't know. Um, there are no specific guidelines for your, your ordinary office spaces. You know, the ASHRAE, again, that, that agency that, that uh, puts out standards for ventilation, says, you know, ventilation is gonna play a minimal role in, in your typical office building. They don't specifically comment on, on gyms. I would imagine it would fall into a similar, a similar category. And it would be different, you know, we think of ventilation maybe as like a fan that's blowing. That's just kind of moving the air around, right? Ventilation, the way an industrial hygienist thinks about it is how much of that air is being removed, how much of that contaminant, whatever it is, whether it's odors, or it's an aerosol, a biological aerosol or a chemical is being removed from that particular space. Um, and that, that can get costly really quickly. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, maybe having, maybe having doors and, and windows open such that it provides some, some uh, through draft would, would certainly help, I would think, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, are, do you have any uh, specific instructions for the bathrooms that might be in a business? Yeah, so um, I want to say, I think it's in the public health order. There's some additional recommendations about having, you know, if you can, touchless uh, entryways, right? So you don't have to use your hands. Um, having uh, touchless garbage bins or keeping the garbage bin right next to the door. So you, you know, wash your hands, you dry your hands, you take the paper towel, open the door, drop the paper towel on the garbage and, and move on. Um, high touch surfaces there we you know there is a potential because we you know when we, we sounds disgusting I apologize we're swallowing our, swallowing our mucus swallowing our, our, our sputum right that it can get into the digestive tract and make its way into the feces so there is a potential as well for uh, you know if you're flushing somebody didn't flush after they finished their business then I might be more cautious with you know um, stepping back as I, as I take care of cleaning that up. There, again, it's probably not a primary driver of transmission. It's a potential driver of transmission. And again, this is an area we're not 100% we're not sure about. But other than that, uh, I think, and there, there is some guidance, and I can, I can dig more into the CDC guidance for reopening, but they have specific uh, recommendations for high-touch surfaces mainly you know, handles, toilet seats, uh, whatnot. But I would think, I would think primarily your routine cleaning would work and then additional disinfection of those, those high touch surfaces. You mean disinfection like after somebody go, after somebody comes out, you rush in and disinfect them for the next person or you just mean a couple times a day rather than once a day or? Yeah, so, so there's sort of mixed guidance there. Um, I think the public health order specifies 
you know, every, every time someone uses a touchpad or a stylus, right, that they're, they're disinfecting those surfaces. I think that, you know, probably because you have the ability to wash your hands as you're leaving, that it's, it's not going to be as high, right? If I, if I finish a sure. transaction at a restaurant, picking food up, and then I leave, and I get into my car, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to disinfect my hands, maybe because I don't have hand sanitizer, or because I'm just, you know, not got home to wash my hands at the sink, and I forget, and I touch my eyes, you know, maybe because having that, uh, that hand sanitizer right there to disinfect or to, you know, take care of my hands right away, is more critical in those situations as opposed to in the bathroom where you've got a sink, you've got soap, presumably. I would obviously make sure you've got a steady supply of, of soap and, uh, and water there. I don't know that there's any reason to restrict uh, bathroom, bathroom access, but I would think, and I, again, I can, I can double check specifically what, they, what CDC requires or, or recommends, I should say, for bathrooms, but I think it's just an increase in the frequency of disinfecting those high touch surfaces and then minimizing the need to touch any surface, right? Whether that's a hands-free uh, entry or propping the door open if that's safe to do so, um, leaving the, the garbage bin by the, by the door. And I'm sure there are other people that may have other, other ideas about how to make that work and probably have some situations where none of those ideas uh, work. And uh, yeah. I guess it's it's good to remember what you said right at the beginning, which is that you can't get it through your skin. Uh, yes, it's, it's it's when you touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So the issue the issue with uh, you know is more the aerosol that could be generated from right. someone you know the toilet flushing and, and releasing that. Though again, right, right. Minor, minor route of transmission, I would think. We have a couple of questions here about specific uh, disinfectant techniques. Um, yeah. Would, for instance, a steam dis uh, steaming, say a pair of shoes have just been tried on, would that be adequate uh, steam cleaning? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, so I believe there are there is some disinfecting protocols being evaluated evaluated for N95 respirators using steam and dry heat. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it would depend on. The, the type of material, and I don't know about you know the shoes, the type of material that they are. I would not think though. If as, so, let you know if we think about transportation, for example, if if we're transporting someone in a vehicle, um, there's no reason to disinfect that that vehicle, right? Just like a plane. Now, if someone were symptomatic, right? If they were coughing, if they were sneezing, if they were aerosolizing, they're they're potentially infectious mucus and, and saliva in, around the area, then maybe you'd want to disinfect the, that pair of shoes. You could also, so here's another potential approach. Don't know how realistic this is. After someone tries it on, you put it in a bag. It's like head lice, right? Put it in a bag and let it, let it deactivate for a week. Yeah. Um, this is another approach that's being looked at for N95 respirators. It's not ideal, I get it. Um, but if it's not viable, likely after three days, certainly not after seven days, that's another way that if there was any chance at all that someone had something on their hands, that they could have put something there. You know, it's, it's not likely that we're going to transmit it through, through uh, our feet, but you could additionally, right, we're, we're very hand-oriented uh, species. We like to touch our face. We like to touch things around us. So we're, we're doing this a lot. If they maybe sanitize right before they try on a pair of shoes and then try the shoes on, right? And, and everyone that comes in sees that you're taking these additional steps and, and, and procedures. If someone were just sitting down on a bench trying on a pair of shoes, I wouldn't think it would be necessary to wipe it down immediately thereafter. You know, there, there are a number of people who would perhaps disagree with me just because it feels like my mom, she, she covered everything in bleach as a kid. Um, she probably would disinfect, even though it's probably not necessary. And I get that there's, there are differences in philosophy about, about that from a public health industrial hygiene standpoint. And certainly what the CDC recommends is not, it's not necessary. If one, so, someone is symptomatic, absolutely necessary, do it. Um, if they're not symptomatic, you know, you're, you're, there's, no, there's no need or minimal, minimal risk there. Um, don't know if that helped answer that. Yeah, it almost seems like the need is as much kind of apparent so that folks feel comfortable trying on that pair of shoes uh, more yeah. 
because I mean, yep. I, I'm pretty sure I can't touch my eyes with my feet. Um, but right. I'm sure some people can, I'm not going right. to right now, but, um, so there, but I guess the outside of the shoe is kind of even more important than the inside at that point. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, you know, if someone, if they were willing to just be, you know, to, to just sanitize their hands before they to do that, I would think yeah. that would be a reasonable first step. And, uh, if they had just recently touched their, touched their face and put that on the shoes could conceivably go to the next person who touches those shoes. Um, but I don't think it would be necessary to sterilize them. Um, and you know, you could put together a lot of this, I think is going to be about communication. So going back to the N95 example, there's a, a hospital that, that uh, started this process of decontaminating uh, N95 respirators, right? Something that's on someone's face all day long, exposed to patients who are potentially sick, decontaminating that and reusing that up to 20 times. They had to communicate with their, with their constituents, say, here, this is what we're doing. This is why it's safe to do that. And so if you need to prove to yourself as well, Right, it, what we're doing is this: is this safe? Right, is is this actually going to be what's most protective of our our staff, ourselves, and and our our customers? You know, then perhaps putting together some kind of a communication, saying here are the steps that we're taking. This is why we think these are the most effective steps. Because you know, the other issue too is we got we what I've seen in other places is people get they start to overuse their disinfectants and then they've got nothing. For when they actually need it, like oh, I just touched my face. Dang, uh, I'm not able to run to the to the sink yet to wash my hands, and I don't want to be in you know in exchanging money or a credit card uh, with with uh, someone, you know, and, and risk that transmission. So I think thinking about how you're going to use it, how frequently you're going to use it, where you're going to use it, is also a big part of that that conversation. Very good. Uh, what what about UV light disinfectants? How are those effective, or when are those effective? Yeah, so um, UV light, it, there, there are a couple different types of UV light. I don't know a whole lot about the specific uh, process. UVA, UVB, UVC. I believe it's UVC that's being used in a medical facility. Um, it's away from people, right, because it's still a carcinogen. Um, but it, it basically deactivates. And I've seen this used in water treatment plants as well, where they pass water over a bank of UV lights and it just, it just denatures the DNA of whatever uh, pathogen is moving through that. It doesn't kill it, it just prevents it from, um, from replicating. Of course, in the case of the virus, it's not living, it just prevents that, it, it damages it, its ability to, um, to reproduce. So again, like if you have an outdoor seating space, probably minim minimal risk if it's exposed to sunshine, you've got disinfectant on that all day long. Um, I don't know how it could be commercialized to work inside of an office space or inside of a retail setting or in a restaurant even. You know, I think it's, it's really in these high tech systems in hospitals where they're moving air and it probably has to be slowed down quite a bit in order for it to provide enough light to do the damage to that viral uh, genetic material. But they looked at using these again for like surgical masks to try and, and, and N95 respirators to try and disinfect. But the issue with UV light is it doesn't penetrate through the material um, the way like heat would or just letting it, you know, wrapping it up in a bag and setting it aside and letting it deactivate. You know, going back to the example of the shoes, if someone who was potentially infectious just, well, we're just gonna wrap these ones up, set them aside, date it, don't open until Christmas or whatever date, uh, you know, a week from now, um, you know, that, that uh, might be more effective than, than using that UV light strategy. Because I don't know that you could just wave a UV light wand and say, okay, it's been disinfected. I don't know how long that dose is required in order to, uh, to affect. I was going to be my next question. You know, maybe you can stop sharing your screen so folks can see, uh, see as you uh, as oh, you're yeah. answering. All right. Um, we have a couple specific questions about venues. So, so uh, one question, they have a, a 195 capacity music venue. It's about 2000 square feet. How would they judge how many people they could uh, uh, use, you know, have, have there now, uh, given the square footage and... Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, if you've got, if you've got uh, family members who are taking geometry, Maybe have them space it out. I've seen a lot of lobby and office type spaces where they have adjusted the seating 
arrangement. They've closed off certain sections, you know, certain circumstances where you've got a family that comes together. Maybe you've got a, a section of four all in a row or five all in a row. Uh, how, about, how about a music venue, just an entertainment or event venue? Yeah. So, so, so the question again is, is how would you determine how many people you could fit into that space? Pretty much. Still maintaining that physical distancing. I think it, it really is going to have to be driven by, you know, that, that space. Is, are we talking about indoor space or outdoor space? Indoor space. Indoor space. I mean, I think, um, yeah, if you've got people who are potentially mingling around, right, they're not, they're not in seats necessarily, you may need to think about having, you know, circles, uh, maybe having movement of, of traffic through the space, you know, a well-marked out single flow of traffic so people aren't crisscrossing as they're walking to and from where they were either standing or sitting. Um, I think that's going to be, that's going to be a challenging one. Uh, increase the price of the tickets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's good without saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so maybe it would be just a matter of putting dots on the floor that are six feet apart and maybe uh, in improving the ventilation or some sort of exhaust system. Uh, yeah, if, if that were feasible, um, yeah. you know, ventilation systems, we just, and one of our clients just had one installed for, you know, two, uh, two room office space is about $10,000. So it's not yeah. cheap. Yeah, no, it's not. I think, I think it's, it's a worthwhile investment if it's something that you can, uh, that you can do for you know, a variety of reasons, but, um, but it might not be for, for everyone. But, but yeah, maybe, maybe there's some other process involved, like getting, getting, figuring out, okay, who's coming? How many people can we comfortably maybe play with a couple different scenarios, looking at a map and, and measuring it out and saying, okay, we can comfortably squeeze 150 people in here or 25 people or whatever the magic number is. And then, well, well we got these other configurations where we've got a family of four that comes together. They want to all sit together. Okay, that takes up less space. They could be in a block here. Um, and, and maybe playing with different, different configurations. I don't know if it's possible to go back and look at prior ticket sales and see what proportion you know, statistically of group size you had coming through, probably not all singles, right? It's probably more couples, probably more triplets and, and families and whatnot. Right, right. Um, and thinking, thinking through how that might, that might look. And so, so capacity isn't even number of people, but kind of num numbers of cohorts or number of, of yeah. Potentially, yeah. So, so exactly, I wouldn't, you know, the fire code, they have specific requirements right. for here, this is the maximum number of people that you can have in this particular space at any one time, which has to do with life safety. But with COVID, it's really, how do you facilitate, how do you maintain that, that six feet of physical distance within, within groups, right? If they're, if they're coming together as a, as a family, no need to split them up. Um, but having, maybe having spaces set up you know, prearranged for, for those, uh, those reservations. Right. Okay. Um, so what about curtains? You talked about soft surfaces. You might just want to remove those. You recommend curtains be removed? So I think that only if it is a high touch surface, right? So I'm thinking more along the lines of like chairs and cushions and couches and uh, things that someone could sit on that would be difficult to clean, um, carpets potentially even. They, I think they found in some uh, places where they had outbreaks that people were tracking it out on their on their shoes. Um, you know, again, lots of people confirm positive. They're infectious. They're contagious. They're symptomatic. They're spreading it around. Um, probably not a, not as big of a concern uh, for for us where we. Ideally, theoretically, we're preventing anybody from, who's sick from coming in. Um, but again, I think the curtains, since it's not a high touch surface, I wouldn't worry about it too much other than your standard, standard cleaning. If people are handling them quite a bit because they need to adjust them and move them, maybe that's a different situation. Maybe for now, for, for, for a time, those are set aside. Um, you know, it's, it's all gonna depend on on the individual, you know, I think that's what's what's challenging about the CDC guidance is it's great for, well, here this is for everybody, but everybody's so unique and their workflow is different, their process is different, and and that's why I think all of us have to just become experts in this, and you you all are in in your respective areas, and this is just yet another curveball that the universe is throwing at you to figure out how to how to uh, 
knock out of the park. Yeah, it, it seems to me that these uh, forest services, the danger is they, they trap stuff and then they can let it go. So if the curtains are just sitting there static in a corner, you know, what are the odds that if it catches anything, it's going to come out? Whereas if it's in a window yep. blowing and billowing or people yep. have to pass through it, then it might be a different story. Yeah, so there is, there is recommendations for clothing. Like if I were, um, in case of one of our clients, they provide uh, mental health services. Sometimes they have to deal with somebody who's decompensating and they need to essentially detain them, right? They're, they're putting their bodies on them. And so they could possibly get viral droplets on their clothing and so what the cdc says to that what they recommend is that you don't shake out your your clothes right so you don't re-aerosolize whatever viral particles are still on your your clothing but in the case that you gave with respect to the curtains if they're not being agitated if they're not being you know blown on um, if people aren't symptomatic when they come in i, I wouldn't think that they would become a um you know, a, a sink or a vector for holding on to that virus and then re-releasing it at a later time. Again, if they're being agitated after somebody sneezes all over them, then maybe that's a different story. Maybe they get backed up, put away. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think with respect to viruses getting onto clothing or other other fabrics, like the main recommendation is is not to uh, simply shake them out. And regular old water as hot as the, the fabric can handle and, and drying seems to be sufficient for disinfecting as well. Yeah, I, I would say that after that video you showed of the, the sneezing, if somebody sneezes on the curtains, I'm going to burn them, I think. Is yeah. what I'm going to do. Right, we have another question here. Um, I work one-on-one -on -one with clients in a confined space as a business. Uh, am I on the right track? Uh, needing to increase the number of air changes per hour, uh, use UV sanitation after sessions, and then decontaminate surfaces. So, so when, yeah. when we say confined space, I'm thinking we mean like an enclosed space because confined is uh, in a regulatory sense has very specific uh, requirements and, and- I would say in the general sense, so probably right. enclosed space, yeah. More enclosed space. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think, I think probably pre-screening, right? Making sure that when they come in, they, they aren't sick. And I think what happened when we were pre-screening people coming back through the country, they were just looking at you know, temperature, which because we know now not everybody exhibits all those signs and symptoms, that's not an, that's, that's an impermeable barrier. Um, so maybe drilling a little deeper, like how do you, especially if you're doing, you know, healthcare related uh, work, um, you know, how are you feeling? Have you been around anybody that's symptomatic? Well, maybe we should reschedule or do more of a virtual appointment today. And then when they come in, you know, if, if it's possible to maintain that source, uh, source control, to maintain that six feet of distance wherever possible, obviously that's not going to be uh, possible 100% of the time. Again, it's not a magic barrier. It's just the more that we can do it, the, the lower our overall risk is. Um, increasing air changes would, would certainly help. In smaller spaces is where those HEPA filters tend to be more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You get big, more bang for your buck in a smaller space, right? If it's in a large mm -hmm. open space, it's just gonna be, it's gonna be filtering its own air. It's not really reaching out and grabbing the, the air on the other side of the lecture hall, so to speak. But if you're in a small 10 by 10 by 10 type room, then you might actually, you can look at, at what the, uh, the throughput is. It'll, it'll say the CFM, the cubic. So you're speed. talking about an air purifier. An air purifier, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, possibly to reduce any any load of aerosol in there. Again, if someone's sick, it's not going to protect you from from getting sick. It's really just going to overall reduce the load of aerosol in in space. Certainly, making it better for the other person when they come in. Um, and uh, I don't know about the UV light. Um, if sun, if you've got natural light coming through, great. But I don't know that purchasing a UV light would necessarily help. And again, as I mentioned, it's a carcinogen. Um, if you get too much exposure on your hands, you will get burned. Um, if you get it in the eyes, you can uh, have additional um, exposures related to, to uh, UV that way as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's it. I would invite people, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and you may ask a question. Uh, feel free to, to ask about your specific situation. Please.
if nobody has a question. I, I did have a question just quickly um, about the process of disinfecting. Say you have your, your one third cup of bleach and a gallon of water. How long does it need to sit there to disinfect something? Just wipe it on and wipe it off? Or? Yeah, I think I glossed over that. Um, it's, a, it's a one minute contact time, that's one what's minute. recommended. Um, so that the surface remains wet with that solution for about a minute. And that's, I think it's also the case with a 70% ethanol uh, based solution as well. So, so a minute is happy birthday six times? Is, yeah. is that right? Okay. Just, <laughs> I, think it'd be, I think it'd be five, but uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, that that is is sufficient to deactivate any viable virus. Okay. Any big questions out there? I'll go ahead. You know, I've seen uh, some of the um, UV light kind of uh, ovens. You want to say uh, maybe on Amazon, and they seem to be like maybe a hundred, hundred fifty bucks, pretty reasonable. Are those? Do you know? Are those effective, or would those be effective for substance, for some businesses? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it would depend on what you were attempting to sanitize or, or sterilize. Uh, again, I think the issue with UV light is, is right on surfaces. It's going gonna, it's gonna to disinfect whatever is there on the surface. But if there's anything that's kind of gone beneath the surface, that might be more challenging to, uh, to like to disinfect. Um, yeah, I don't what 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 in mind were you thinking to to uh, disinfect? You're muted, Sean. Um, say, for instance, maybe a, a mask. A mask, like a, a N95 respirator, or maybe some of the you you see a lot of people are using the cloth masks uh -huh. nowadays, and uh, you know I always worry about the bacteria <laughs> and the moisture. The, the moisture that feeds it <laughs> yeah so okay so you bring up a good a good point so they're these really are not intended to be reused day in and day out right a lot of people i think I, I don't know for sure are using them day after day and they then become a source of contamination right and and there are other things out there other than COVID 19 as, as you as you uh have alluded to um i think in that case if they're machine washable Washer and dryer is going to be is going to be just as effective, if not more effective, especially because that UV light won't really penetrate into the matrix of that mask if there's anything else that's made its way inside. Um, and they and they found this to be the case with trying to disinfect surgical masks and okay. respirators. So it's it's great for like a like a solid surface. You see this in the university setting, um, in the laboratories where you've got a biological safety cabinet. You close the sash and you turn on the UV light and it's disinfecting while nothing's in there, right? Because the surfaces are just completely barren. And so it's extremely sterile when you get back to work in that biological safety cabinet. But yeah, limited, limited effectiveness for general uh, use, I think. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure, good question. Uh, Jared, did you have a question? It seemed like you're about to ask something. No, it wasn't a question. Um, I just want to congratulate um, um, you guys, the chamber, and and um, is Dr. Moore, correct? Oh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Almost Dr. Moore. COVID. <laughs> okay. I'm a doctor. A COVID, COVID, COVID affected, candidate. right? Um, no, it's it's really interesting that you guys are having this level of conversation. The reality of fact is, is that um, uh, I work for Alameda County, by the way. And so I'll tell you that your presentation um, is pretty spectacular and it's comprehensive and you seem to be pretty knowledgeable um, about what you're talking about. Um, I just want to update you guys that this conversation that you're having right now is um, you're ahead of the curve as far as um, I think other chambers. Right now we are talking, uh, we, are, we are organizing through our East Bay um, Economic Development Alliance, uh, a task force to do exactly what you guys were, do, were doing, which is reaching out to, to businesses and, and, and informing them about how they um, you know, can begin the quote unquote opening up, I don't like that word, but relaxing of the shelter in place order. Um, and so I just wanna commend you guys and um, I am going to make sure that we have our East Bay EDA um, executive director reach out to you guys um, um, uh, as an example for what I think they should be doing. So good job. Well, thanks thanks so much. Appreciate it. Friend, Jessica, did you have a question you wanted to ask or would you rather I just read it? <laughs> You're still muted. Hi. So thanks so much. This has been great. I 
it seems like gloves were a, a huge um, suggestion in the beginning. And I was finding that people just weren't using them effectively. It was kind of a false sense of safety. And I'm wondering, you know, with hand washing and masks, are those just a better first line of defense and kind of doing away with this, you know, intense uh, pressure for everyone to wear gloves? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. And uh, I, I managed to, uh, to avoid the, uh, the glove <laughs> topic, but um, no, great question. I think, I think really it's about arresting that, that the, the transmission, right? Whatever surface I'm contacting and then my face. If I'm wearing a glove, it's not going to stop that transmission if I'm not avoiding touching my face, if I'm not reusing um, hand sanitizer or washing my hands. Uh, obviously, if I'm working with some kind of a cleaning product that requires gloves, excellent time to be using the right type of glove, chemically resistant glove. But as far as me, use, I don't use them when I, when I go out in public. I just avoid touching my, my face. Um, the face mask, of course, is really designed to, again, block that, that transmission of me, whatever, whatever secretions I have on my face, giving it out to the rest of the world. So that face covering is, is, is multi uh, multifunctional in that respect. And I think it is much more effective in uh, protecting or preventing that, that transmission than, than wearing gloves. I, I agree that they do tend to be, provide a false sense of security. And, you know, people are still rubbing their noses. I, you know, face coverings also, if people are not using them correctly, also provide a false sense of security. They, you know, they're hanging down below their face. They're still rubbing their their noses reg more regularly, and so it's all these things combined that we have to be thinking about in order to really uh, minimize the, the transmission. But great, great question. Don't know if I answered it. Let me uh, do that real quick. Uh, all right, any more questions, folks? Any? Uh, I'm not seeing any in the chat. Well, thanks, Todd. I really appreciate yeah. your uh, willingness to entertain this this conversation, and uh, and thanks for all the great questions from everyone. Thanks for your, your participation and 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 being out there. And I think you know the other thing that I wanted to stress is that um, you know we we want to think about ourselves just being more compassionate and and more empathetic. I think than we than we have previously. Um, there was a great. Yeah. presentation one of my uh, professors gave on, you know, in past recessions, uh, you know, there has not been nearly the same level of uh, mortality as there were during past pandemics and that we really need to control the pandemic first before worrying about the, the recession. And I think that's really because, you know, from a, from a uh, community standpoint, we, we have, we're biologically hardwired to come together and to support one another and to look out for each other's best interests. My professor, a human happiness professor at, uh, at Berkeley, uh, Dacher Keltner, uh, his whole you know, thesis is basically we're, we're, we're pro-social in nature. That's just, that's who we are. Um, and so I think it's really important to be monitoring our own, our own stress levels, making sure we're getting exercise, making sure we're getting as much sleep as we can, uh, making sure that, that we're, you know, thinking about health in a, in a holistic manner. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of what I feel this, this work is for me as well. And just trying to provide a little more context, a little less anxiety about how, we, how do we engage with this new normal, right? This is something that we're gonna have to deal with for the next couple of years, I would imagine. Um, but uh, also happy to continue having these conversations, whether that's in some formal capacity through the chamber or with you individually. And uh, Todd mentioned that um, he could post the presentation and I'll, I'll see if I can update some, some slides as well around the questions that you had asked, provide some additional resources there and my contact info will be, will be there as well. That's right, so thanks so much. And, and we will be posting the recording on the chamber website, give it a day or two, it takes a little time to do. And uh, it sounds like we'll have the slide deck so we can post that as well. Yeah. And uh, certainly Dave would, will be available. This is what he does. So he, if you had a specific need, I'm sure he would be willing to come out and evaluate uh, your, your business as a service that he would provide as, as a business. So um, yep, absolutely, uh, appreciate everybody.
And with that, I think I'm going to say uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to David. Let's have a visual <laughs> round of applause for, for, for David. And, uh, and we'll sign off here. Thanks so much. All right. Take care.